Thank you very much, Eric. So take the opportunity to give feedback to our speakers, put up your tricky questions and, uh, you know, make it more live. We appreciate that. It's a true pleasure to me to welcome our keynote speaker, a person that I've been admiring for a very long time. I won't give you any spoiler. Please look for yourself. We are so proud to welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Ross Anderson from Cambridge University, one of the founders of the discipline of security economics and PI of the Cambridge Cybercrime Center, a pioneer in power line communications, prepayment metering, peer-to-peer -peer systems, hardware tamper resistance, and API security. He has just written the third edition of his book, Security Engineering, a guide to building dependable distributed systems. Good morning. Um, I'm Ross Anderson. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and I've been asked to talk on the sustainability of safety and security. Now, I've done things um, around electricity metering and control systems and other security topics for quite a number of years now. But I want to pick up the story five years ago um, when the um, European Commission um, asked us, um, three of us, Aaron Leverett, Richard Clayton and me, to examine what the Internet of Things implied for safety regulation. Now, the EU regulates safety in dozens of different verticals, and the concern is once you get software and communications and everything, how does the world change for regulators? Now, we looked at three specific industries, cars, medical devices, and electricity transmission and distribution, um, as test cases because these were systems that we knew something about. But the results that we got are somewhat more general. Now we reported back to the European Union in 2016 and our paper first appeared at the workshop on the economics of information security in 2017. And the, um, the summary is that once there's software everywhere, safety and security get entangled. And there's going to be a significant job in updating safety uh, regulation and also the ecosystem of safety regulators in order to cope. Now, um, safety engineering is something that will be dear to the hearts of many people at this conference. And as we know, markets do safety in some industries way better than others. Um, the incentives for safety in aviation are pretty good uh, because if there's a plane crash, it's front page news, um, the pilots um, usually lose their lives because they're first on the scene of the accident. The airlines lose money. Um, the um, aircraft manufacturers may uh, also take a hit. Whereas in medicine, um, the incentives aren't so good uh, because, you know, the harm is distributed. People die one at a time. As for cars, they were dreadful until Ralph Nadel's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, led to the foundation of NHTSA. And in the EU, you've got a number of broad frameworks and product liability and the framework directive on car safety for type approval and many detail, detailed rules. And when you look across the different um, engineering disciplines, there's um, over 20 European Union agencies in play here. So um, looking first at cars, um, people didn't used to think of cars as things that could be hacked until 2011, um, when um, Yoshi Kono and his colleagues produced a paper on Car Shark, a means of hacking a car if you had physical access, if you could somehow install software that would um, hack CAN bus and um, uh, would then enable you to take control of a vehicle remotely. However, that remained an academic curiosity. What brought it to public attention was in 2015 when Charlie Miller and Chris Vanashek um, hacked a Jeep Cherokee uh, going over the air via Chrysler's uh, Uconnect. And they managed to take over a car that had a consenting journalist in it, slow it down and run it off the road. And that really was front page news that got on all the primetime TV channels in America. And um, it made clear that in some circumstances, all you need to hack a car uh, is an IP address. So all of a sudden that got sea level attention and Chrysler had to spend over a billion dollars recalling over a million uh, Jeeps in order to do a software fix. 
which they had to do by um, reflashing the relevant ships. Then, of course, we had the emission scandal. Um, some of you, particularly those from Germany, will recognize the block on the um, uh, slide here. Martin Winterkorn um, used to be the CEO of Volkswagen. Now he's facing trial for putting software into cars which cheated on emission standards. So the threat model um, isn't just insiders. It can be insiders right at the top. It can be the CEO um, of your supplier, um, of, of the vendor on whom you rely, who's cheating you. Looking at medicine, um, tell me, um, how many CPUs can you see here? Now, this is an intensive care unit in Swansea Hospital. This is where you end up um, if uh, your car gets hacked and um, wanders into the, um, the, the, the opposing carriageway. How many CPUs? Ah, oh, good, the animation is working. So you can see at the bedside of a typical patient in an intensive care unit, there's almost as many CPUs um, as you have inside a car, uh, but they are integrated on the spot. They're plugged together by the nurse, and they've got quite a confusing uh, variety of user interfaces. So, so here's the next point on safety. These are the infusion pumps um, photographed in the intensive care unit in Swansea by my colleague um, Harold Thimbleby. And as you can see, there's a confusing variety of interfaces. Um, if you look only at the two bodyguard 545 pumps, uh, you can see that on one of them, you increase the dosage using a two and you decrease it using a zero, whereas on the other, you increase it using a five and you decrease it using a zero. And this, it turns out, is really bad news from the point of view of safety usability. And Harold Thimbleby, who took these pictures, and has become an expert in this, uh, particularly since his father was killed in an accident involving an infusion pump, he's come to the conclusion that hospital safety usability failures kill about 2,000 people every year in the UK, about the same as road accidents. Safety usability tends to be ignored because the incentives are wrong, um, but attacks are very much harder to ignore. And in 2015, again, which was a... a, 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 a flashbulb year in this field, uh, there was a demo of Wi-Fi tampering um, with an infusion pump which led the FDA to blacklist a particular product. Since then, we've seen the recall of 450,000 pacemakers made by St. Jude because they could also be hacked over the air. And this was, in fact, even um, incorporated in a movie plot where the bad guys kill the U.S. vice president by hacking his pacemaker. So what should Europe do? Well, um, in Europe, um, the authorities have started revising the Medical Devices Directive, uh, which was supposed to come in force this year and will now come in force next year, requiring post-market surveillance, a para-device risk management plan, ergonomic design, and various other things. Here's Regulation 17.2. For devices that incorporate software, the software shall be developed in accordance with the state of the art, taking into account the principles of development life cycle, risk management, including information security, verification, and validation. 18.8, devices shall be designed and manufactured in such a way as to protect as far as possible against unauthorized access that could hamper the device from functioning as intended. And this is, still isn't perfect because there's wriggle room and ergonomics and network security assumptions. And it doesn't tackle the underlying safety usability problem because that's a, a cross-vendor thing. Uh, but it's still a significant improvement. So where are we for industrial control systems? Well, I started off in this field some 30 years ago. Um, working on what's now the STS specification for prepayment electricity meters, um, of which there's now some 400 million devices fielded in 100 countries. And 10 years ago, we came back to it working on um, electricity substations. Uh, we were doing some work with ABB, which has been mentioned in one or two talks last year, but at the time, um, ABB was uh, engaged in dealing with new standards which were supposed to introduce authentication 
into um, protocols such as DNP3 so that substations could support authentication. Now, the problem in ICS was that the protocols that are used there, like the protocols used in sidecars, CAN bus, don't support authentication because when these protocols were evolved, um, you know, basically by my father's generation, um, there was no need for that. Um, all communications was local or alternatively on leased um, dial up, on, on leased uh, telephone lines. Now, starting in the mid 1990s, um, everybody um, started putting networking uh, on IP because it's an awful lot cheaper. And the problem there is that suddenly anyone who knows a sensor's IP address can read from it. And if you've got an actuator's IP address, you can activate it. And starting in the late 90s, people began to work on this. And the company that's now Belden was uh, kicked off as a startup in the University of British Columbia. When we got into this 10 years later, there were draft standards saying that you had to have authentication on the LAN. And this actually made no sense. First of all, it was undoable because the protocols that were being pushed by the US government involved signing everything with 2048-bit RSA, which you just simply can't do if the um, latency requirement on goose messages is five milliseconds. So could we um, redo the authentication using message authentication codes instead? We looked at that, we looked at what was involved in practice and how you go about do, doing key management in a substation. Where do you put all the keys into the devices? Do you do it in the factory when you're doing factory tests or in the field when you're doing acceptance tests? We looked into this in some detail. But then eventually we said, hang on a minute, what on earth is the point on doing authentication on a substation LAN? Because if anybody can cut the fence and get in, they can just walk up to the transformer or to the recloser and press the big red button boom, uh, and switch the thing off. What you're actually worried about um, is scalable remote attacks. And so the only uh, realistic and economic fix, as the, the guys in Belden had realized 10 years um, earlier, is to re-perimetrize, have a decent firewall and replace it every five years. Now, this led us to engagement with smart grids, and this led us to the um, whole uh, series of problems around smart meters. Um, we suddenly realized that the UK, which had committed itself to a huge smart meter project for entirely political reasons, it made no economic sense at all, uh, because in Britain the electricity meter is owned by the retailer rather than by the distribution network operator. So there's no way that the retailer will be allowed, will, will allow you to use that to decrease sales volume. So claims of um, energy saving are uh, basically stuff and nonsense. But nonetheless, Britain was spending £20 billion, in effect, putting a remotely commandable off switch into every uh, one of the 28 million homes in Britain. And also, we were putting in a remotely commandable off switch into the 25 million homes that had gas meters as well, despite there being no um, sensible case for um, smart gas metering because gas can be stored. So we wrote a paper, Who Controls the Off Switch, which caused a bit of a panic, and GCHQ rushed to involve itself in the standardization process for smart meters. And that standardization process dragged on for years and years and years, and now we have got uh, millions of smart meters in Britain that don't talk to each other, and if you change your electricity supplier, uh, then you end up having to read your smart meter yourself, um, once a month and emailing the results off to the power company. And smart meters are very much more difficult to read manually than um, good old-fashioned electromechanical meters. So yes, we do have some of the uh, experience and we do have some of the scars of struggling with the security of industrial control systems. So since 2001, 2011, Germany has been pushing this idea of Industrie 4.0. So the idea is that um, you'll have lots of machine to machine communication and that all the machine tools can talk to each other and they can talk to the website where people go and order stuff. And then you'll be able to customize your Mercedes as you offer, as you order it from um, Stuttgart, and all the machines there will come together to make exactly the variant of the Mercedes that you want to buy. That's kind of what happens already, but it's going to be a bit more automated. So what can we reasonably expect is going to happen here? 
Well, on the basis of experience in the car industry and in the medical device industry, there's a number of things we can say. First, if you open previously closed systems, then that's going to lead to a whole lot of issues because you will find that there's all sorts of uh, things going on in factories, which, as with um, CAN bus in cars and uh, as, as with DNP3 uh, and, and other protocols and substations, uh, are going to be fundamentally unprotected. Um, you're going to be dealing with every site as a brownfield site where there's lots and lots of legacy kid. So all of a sudden, you're going to have to find that you have to patch everything. Now, when it comes to patching cars, um, the problem is um, that you have, in a typical car, somewhere between 50 and 100 CPUs. And these come from um, a whole series of suppliers, perhaps 20 or 50 different suppliers. And nothing is open source in the car world. If uh, car vendor A buys from tier one supplier B, uh, then one will supply a binary to the other under an NDA which say, says that they're not supposed to try and disassemble it, they're supposed to call the software in this way. And this means that the integration testing is a real pain. You end up with a lab car, that is a rack of equipment um, that's got all the electronic devices in it that you find in a production car, plus some simulation hardware which enables you to say, right, let's do a 50 kilometer per hour uh, front um, offside collision, click. And so you, so you can go through all sorts of um, testing cycles and see how the electronics uh, respond. So the integration testing is a massive uh, problem and a massive pain. Um, there are issues of the extent to which an OEM uh, can get tier one suppliers, even let alone tier two or tier three suppliers to patch stuff. Because once the contract's done and people are working on other things, the team may have been dispersed. And so there are all sorts of compliance costs, as there are indeed in phones and, and laptops at the present, but they're much worse. And the maintenance costs really pile up at the integration testing phase. Because if, if you're a typical car company, someone like Mercedes, who launches a new product range every year, and let's say you've got seven ranges and you refresh one every year, and you're going to keep these in the field for 20 years, then that's 140 different product ranges for which you have to maintain patchability for your diesel engine controller. And if you're someone like Bosch, who is maintaining diesel engine controllers for a dozen um, different um, car companies, that means that you've got hundreds and hundreds of different versions of your engine controller software. And this fan out is what absolutely kills you in maintenance costs. So the software maintenance costs simply become um, mind blowing. The next point is Kharkov's principle, because unfortunately, as um, industry gets more and more online, there are clouds getting everywhere, and um, the clouds often become fog um, from the point of view of the developers trying to understand what's going on. However, it isn't quite that way, uh, because when you have multiple layers of outsourcing where people are... Um, putting their stuff in clouds that are controlled by other people, you end up with your information getting everywhere. Now, we came across a case, for example, um, where um, a certain um, industrial firm uh, was doing maintenance on stuff in buildings, and they had subcontractors um, who were looking at things like alarm signaling and so on and so forth. And the subcontractors went and stuck stuff in a cloud where the, um, uh, there was a compromise and the bad guys got at it. And we ended up having to figure out um, how many hundred factories, schools, prisons, military bases, data centers, and so on, and ended up having um, all their drawings uh, potentially compromised to bad people who may have been linked to foreign state actors. So if you're someone like the FSB and you would like a burglar's guide to all let's say, to all military bases in Germany, um, then you have got a very large number of people that you can look to. Not just all the people who do the burglar alarms and the fire alarms and the heating and ventilation and everything else, but all the subcontractors they use too. So you might have 50 or 100 different companies, any one of which you can compromise in order to get at the plans.
And what this means is that we get back to Kirchhoff's principle. Auguste Kirchhoff, in the 1860s, wrote the first book on um, cryptographic engineering, and he said you have to assume that the method will be known to the opponent, and all you can do is hope that the security will reside in the choice of key. And this is deeply contrary to the instincts of traditional physical security people and production managers at factories who assume that they have got some confidentiality in how their, uh, the information about how their plant is laid out, how it's wired, and so on. The next problem that comes once you start putting clouds everywhere is what happens when the cloud goes away, what happens when it evaporates in the sunshine, for example, of an antitrust suit over in America. We're already seeing this problem with smart fridges, where you go and spend an extra $400 for a fridge, and two years later, a Mr. Samsung or whoever decides that that cloud has had its day, and the smart fridge turns into a frosty brick sitting in the corner of your, of your kitchen. So you're beginning to get a whole lot of the problems in your factory automation that we've had to struggle with elsewhere. And on top of this, you've got to be able to do contingency planning. Um, the talk last year from the guy at Norris Hydro was, I think, a bit of a jaw-dropper. He pointed out that even when you lost all your um, um, enterprise information systems to malware, it was still possible using old-fashioned manual techniques to keep hydro power plants, aluminium smelters, uh, and bauxite refineries going. Would that be the case with a car company? Well, hey, your mileage may vary, as they say. So, there's a number of things in common, though, with factory automation, um, cars, uh, medical devices, and other stuff. But as this stuff scales up, who's going to investigate incidents and to whom will they be reported? If there's a car crash, uh, you can't get data from Mr. Tesla unless you get a, co a court order. Um, will your local police be able to understand data from the Tesla? At the moment, that's only a few specialists from NHTSA who can do that. Where's the capability in Europe going to be to um, understand um, and investigate what's going on? Next problem is how do you embed responsible disclosure? There was a law case a few years ago when the universities of Nijmegen and Birmingham um, figured out how to break um, the remote key entry system used by Volkswagen. They did responsible disclosure, they gave the company a year or so's notice, but nothing was done until the last minute when Volkswagen panicked, sued them, got a court order that stopped the paper appearing at Usenix, universities fought back, um, they won in court and uh, Volkswagen got its secrets disclosed and it got egg in its face as well, right? The IT industry has been through this learning process over the past 30 years and we now understand things like bug bounties, we understand the patching cycle but industrial companies just aren't there yet. There's a, safety, there's, a, there's a cultural question next of how do you bring safety engineers and security engineers together. It's difficult enough um, treating security engineers as one discipline, but in safety it's much worse because you've got separate communities of people who do air safety, car safety, medical safety, factory safety, nuclear safety and other kinds of safety. There are then issues at the policy level. Are the regulators all going to need to employ engineers? At present, many of the regulatory agencies in Brussels don't have any engineers at all. They've just got lawyers, accountants, and policy people. So how on earth do you embed the knowledge for them to make sensible decisions? And how do you prevent abuse of lock-in? Because technology is plagued by monopolies, large and small, because of network effects, because of technical lock-in, and so on and so forth. In other words, you need... Uh, much more um, tech-savvy regulation for things to work. So we came out with a report, and the um, report included requiring vendors to self-certify for the CE mark that products can be patched if need be, requiring a secure development lifecycle with vulnerability management. We suggested creating a European security engineering agency because Elisa wasn't allowed to get involved in policy in Brussels. What actually happened? Um, is that Anissa pushed for and got an expanded role and opened a Brussels office under the Cyber Security Act. And this was, in fact, one of the um, good consequences of Brexit because previously it had been the UK which had been blocking this. 
because our spook agency, GCHQ, didn't want a competitor in Brussels, which it um, took pleasure in hacking from time to time, as you'll know from the Snowden disclosures. We also recommended expanding the product liability directive to services. At present, it only uh, covers goods and updating the NIS directive to report breaches and vulnerabilities to safety regulators and users rather than just to the three and four letter agencies. We didn't get any progress yet on those two points, but they will remain on the agenda for the future. Okay, so what's the punchline from the report? Well, this wasn't something that we were explicitly told to look at, but something that jumped out at us from the data that we collected and from all the people that we spoke to. And it's this. So far, there's um, a couple of ways in which you can build a secure device. With phones and laptops, you keep them secure by patching them monthly, um, but they do then make them obsolete quickly so you don't have to support 100 different models. Your phone typically goes out of support after two or three years unless it's an iPhone when it might last five. Laptops, you're lucky you might get five. The second type of secure thing that we know how to make um, are things like cars and medical devices and, of course, electricity substations and factory automation, where you test them to death before you start using them, but you don't connect them to the Internet and you almost never patch them. Okay, so you're still running with Windows 95 and the size will be um, power station, and um, you can't patch that because Microsoft doesn't offer patches anymore. But does it matter so long as that nuclear power station is, is offline? Okay, so here's the crunch. What happens to support costs now that we're starting to collect durable goods to the internet, um, which means that we have to patch them? Okay, so what's the implication of this for the economics of factory automation? Well, I don't know, we can guess, but let's look at vehicle um, economics. Um, and the trilemma that we face, I think, across all of these areas um, is that in the standard safety life cycle, there's no patching, so you get safety and sustainability. But if you go online, you get hacked. Or you can go for the standard security life cycle, um, where you get patching, but that breaks safety certification. But if, on the other hand, you do patching plus um, safety certification, um, you know, so you're forever um, redoing your safety certification with every upgrade cycle, then your, the cost of maintaining your safety rating can be sky high. So here's the problem. Can you get safety, security, and sustainability at the same time? Now, with vehicles, um, vehicle lifetimes in Europe have about doubled in 40 years. And in the UK, a car is now about 15 years old when it's scrapped. And when we started talking with car makers back in 2015, the view in the OEMs, because of the excitement about self-driving cars, would be that, well, guys, in future, you're not going to buy a car. You're going to get mobility as a service. Uh, and basically, we're only going to maintain software for six years. You scrap the car after six years and buy a new one. Now, that was fairly self-centered because at present, the business model of companies like Mercedes and BMW and Volkswagen is that if you've got a lot of money, they will sell you a new car. And if you've got slightly less money, they will sell you an approved used car, in each case on a three-year lease. Um, but if you are buying, uh, if you are driving an eight-year-old car as I am, then you are a bad person and kindly scrap it and buy a new one or emigrate or something. They just don't want to know about drivers of old cars except as a, a market for overpriced spare parts. But here's the rub. The embedded CO2 cost of a car often exceeds its lifetime fuel burn. So an E-Class Mercedes, for example, costs about 35 tons of carbon to build, and you can work it out that that's a bit over 200,000 kilometers um, if you're getting something like 45 miles per gallon. And then what about Africa, where most vehicles are imported secondhand? If you go to Nairobi, you see all the cars are between 10 and 20 years old because they're driven for um, 10 years in somewhere like Britain or Japan or wherever, and then they're put on um, ships and taken to Mombasa. So what's going to happen to vehicles in Africa? And this cartoon just about sums up... Um, <coughs> the IT approach uh, to the world. My engine's making a 
weird noise. Can you take a look? Sure, just pop the hood. Oh, the hood latch is also broken. Or just put up to that big pit and push the car in. We'll go get a new one. Right? That's what happens if you take your laptop to PC World and you complain that you've got some, some malware on it. They say, hey, the disk is 80% full and it's four years old. We got a really good deal on your, your Lenovo's. Right? You can't take that attitude across the world of cars or to electricity substations or to factory automation. So how do we understand all this stuff? Well, as was mentioned in the introduction, one of the things that I've been spending about a third of my time on for the past 20 years is developing the economics of dependability as a subject. Now, we realized round about the um, turn of the millennium that complex socio-technical systems often fail because of poor incentives. Um, if Alice guards a system but Bob pays the cost of failure, you can expect trouble. Example, payment systems. In order to stop fraud in payment systems, you need the merchant and the bank that acquires transactions from the merchant to take care. However, the costs of fraud fall on the cardholder and on the bank which issues the payment card to the cardholder. And the two aren't the same. And so you end up getting lower fraud um, in countries like the Netherlands and Finland, which have got reasonably tight banking regulation, or in Singapore, which is very tight, and you get higher costs of fraud um, in places like Britain and America and Spain and Latvia, where the banks have too much power and push around the banking regulators. So many of these security problems end up being governance problems rather than just bad weather. And security economics can explain an awful lot more. We explain platform security problems. Why is Microsoft software so vulnerable despite all the money that they spend on it? What about the patching cycle? What's the optimal time to patch? And how do you do responsible disclosure, coordinated disclosure, and so on? The liability games that people play. Many of the things, in short, that we used to treat as just bad weather, as inexplicable aspects of human perversity, turn out to be perfectly obvious once you think of the incentives that face both people and institutions. Now, the same principles apply to safety, and they're going to become ever more important as safety and security become entangled. So what can we do? Well, what our work fed into was Directive 771 last year, the EU Directive on um, the uh, Upgrade to Sales of Goods Law. And this says that buyers of goods with digital elements are entitled to necessary updates for two years or for a longer period if this is a reasonable expectation of the customer. Observe the language, goods with digital elements. And this was designed to mean, first, goods that have got embedded software, Second, goods that talk to a cloud service. And third, good, goods that talk to a mobile phone app. So you've got to maintain not just the software in the device itself, you've got to keep the cloud service up, and you've got to keep updating the app. Now, the, the question that this leads to is, what is a reasonable expectation of the customer? Well, a reasonable design lifetime for cars has to be at least 20 years because software will be in development for three years, the car will be on sale for seven, and then it's 10 years from the last new sale. Uh, we already have other law in the key which says that. And the, the car makers really don't like this, and that's tough because their, their lobbying power in Brussels and also in Germany slipped because of uh, Mr. Winterkorn's sins, uh, and that enabled the EU to get this stuff through. Domestic appliances, there's an obligation of spares for 10 years, plus there's the lifetime of the thing in the store, plus a development life, which is a bit less, so let's say 15 or maybe more. Medical devices, um, talk to a cardiologist, they replace people's pacemakers every 10 years or so. So again, uh, with um, life in the hospital storeroom, then surely something similar. Electricity substations could be 40 years. And this could be the most painful of all because you've got no consumer protection law to help you. And an interesting comparison here is between cars and tractors. Um, with cars, vendors can't use digital lock-in techniques, but with tractors they do. And this leads to enormous fights in America uh, between John Deere and its customers in farming. 
So here I propose a grand challenge for research. Now, if the durable goods that we're designing today are still working in 2060, then things have to change. Now, computer science is about managing complexity. And ever since the first proper computer was turned on here in Cambridge in May 1949, um, we've been building tools to make programming less painful from the uh, very first um, autocoder that, that got written here through high-level languages in the 1950s, then types in the 1960s and objects, and then tools like Git and Jenkins and Coverity. And so what we have to be asking as computer scientists and software engineers is what else will be needed for sustainable computing once we've got software and just about everything. And um, so research topics to support 40-year patching include a more stable and powerful tool chain, the history of cryptography, of what's happened to TLS over the past 20 years teaches us how complex this can be, Cars teach the difficulty of sustaining all the test environments. Android teaches how do you motivate OEMs to patch products they no longer sell. Control systems can maybe bring something to the party too. How far can we push reperimetrization? How much can you get from architecture? Because surely you can't have every machine tool in the world talking to every website in the world. You've got to have choke points somewhere. That's about architecture. That's about limiting the complexity by how you design stuff. And um, implications for research and teaching. Um, since 2016 17, I've been teaching safety and security together in the same course to first year undergraduates. And we're also starting to look at what we can do to make the tool chain more sustainable. For example, how do you stop the compiler writers being a subversive fifth column and coming up with optimizations that uh, break your crypto code? by causing it to no longer execute in, in constant time. I was about to give a couple of slides on that, but I won't because I see that I'm getting towards my time. Uh, but all this is on my website. And I will say that thanks to the pandemic, uh, my lecture um, course on software and security engineering is also completely online. And you can go to my website and now and enjoy it just like um, our undergraduates do. So let me just... Um, go through to the um, penultimate slide. Um, the papers on making security sustainable on standardization and certification of the Internet of Things. That's our report to the EU. And who controls the off switch can all be found on my webpage. Um, you can also see our blog where we post stuff that we come up with as we come up with it. Um, the next event where you can come and hear all about the economics of information security is the workshop on the economics of information security in Brussels. That's going to be online this year and it's going to be free, so do turn up and listen. And finally, um, as it was mentioned in the introduction, um, I've upgraded my textbook on security engineering um, to cover all these issues and more. And all the chapters are currently on my web page and available free for download until the end of this month. Um, so you better um, hurry up and download it because if you wait until November, uh, then you'll have to pay uh, unless you're bright enough to use the Wayback Machine. But um, you know, this is a special concession from my publishers to have the book online for review and comment. And um, 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 so, so, so that we can get feedback during the proofreading stage. And with that, um, I think it's time for questions. Well, yes, Ross, thank you very much for your immense wisdom within the security engineering field. Uh, we have a lot of questions, of course. Uh, so I'd like to start up with uh, this one. Can we learn anything? Uh, sorry. <laughs> what about security development methods that make products sustainable right from the start, since they then stay secure and safe? What is needed to reach this utopia? Well, that's one of the big debates in our field and has been for a very long period of time. And um, the current um, bleeding edge is DevSecOps. And how do you go about integrating security into a DevOps cycle where you, are, where you no longer have separation of powers between development and ops? Now, this brings a number of opportunities. It means that you can potentially fix bugs very, very quickly. But it also brings a number of uh, problems and threats. 
How do you, for example, maintain separation of powers within development? How do you see to it that all running code has been looked at by independent people, you know, who aren't un under any particular development pressure, uh, and that they've tested it properly? So this, again, is something that the penultimate chapter in my book discusses at some length. Well, I have a follow-up question on that. How would you think that DevOpsSec would work in an ICS environment? Well, I don't really know. The, um, the best documented guide to doing DevSecOps is probably um, the recent book from Google, which describes what they do. There have been similar offerings from Amazon, but they're very much more telegraphic. Um, when it comes to um, doing development in um, things like cryptographic hardware security modules, which I know a bit about, you end up having to have um, a staged approach uh, because you end up having to recertify devices. And so you might end up only shipping updates every three months or six months because of the, uh, the cost and expense of that cycle. And I would tend to expect that if you're someone like ABB or Honeywell or GE or Siemens, um, then um, you would be somewhere um, in that space, that you should probably um, have a program which says, you know, we're going to have a six monthly refresh on our products. Right. Uh, so, but I think that the, the one asking the question was more interested in understanding if it's possible to make products secure and stay secure without updating. I mean, is it well, possible? Maybe, is it if the, maybe if there's only 20 lines of code and you prove it formally correct. But, but even then you're going to get screwed because um, the assumptions that you made when proving your theorems will always be inadequate for the real world. The, the, the simple fact is that we live on a planet where there's maybe 5 million people who spend their lives um, updating stuff, changing operating systems, changing CPUs, changing applications. And the, there's a, only a small number of things can remain kind of unchanged. And the things that remain unchanged uh, tend to be protocols that are so widely distributed that they're just too difficult uh, and too expensive to change. Uh, protocols such as SMTP, DNS, and so on and so forth. And you end up having to engineer around them um, in order to deal with the um, security issues that arise. Right. So, so do you have any comments on the, the approach taken by Cell4? You know Cell4? The, they have this mathematical proven way of, uh, of assuring that uh, the function is working as expected. Well, I think that proof is enormously overstated. There are far too many computer scientists who are basically mathematicians who don't actually write software or work with real systems. And if they had been born 50 years ago, they would not have been professors of computer science. They would have been professors of analytic number theory or algebraic geometry. But because there's no money in that anymore, they're proving theorems about categories and types and so on, and they're pretending that it's computer science, saying, well, our work might be relevant to compilers someday. But if you ask them, have you ever written a plug-in for LLVM, they'll say, what's LLVM? <laughs> right? I'm sorry, guys. This is a load of baloney. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. So, so here's a, hopefully an, <laughs> an easier question for you. Uh, how do you see uh, and what, what are views on the zero trust religion within ICS? On the what? Zero trust. Z on, on, what do you mean? Z Z you zero, mean zero trust, trust? Like, like in, uh, I think that uh, in the ARM, zero trust. Or sorry, zero trust, it must be the zero trust uh, from Google called zero trust um. before. Well, so the, sure. um, well, the Beyond Trust Corp me. initiative in Google basically says that instead of having a defended corporate network so that you've got a, a hard shell, soft core approach to how you run your systems, which used to be how they run the company, you instead um, have everything um, inside um, assumed to be on the internet. You assume that there are bad guys inside and your perimeter defenses basically stop things like denial of service. You assume that the, um, the Chinese and the Russians and so on have got some kind of bridgehead inside your corporate network and you see to it that you have got um, proxies on every device that's inside which do strong authentication. And that involves doing a lot of work. It means keeping absolutely everything up to date. It means having absolutely rigorous inventory of what all the devices are that are allowed to talk to your network. 
Um, and if you have started from a relatively greenfield site and you've got vast amounts of money and lots of capable engineers, then sure you can do that. Um, this in fact goes back to a debate in um, Auckland 95, I think it was, between Carl Ellison and Steve Bellavin about whether we should have firewalls. And Carl was making the zero trust argument that of course you must patch um, all your machines and of course you must train all your staff to never click on links in emails. And um, therefore, if you are this virtuous, you don't need a firewall. And Steve Bellavin was arguing, saying, yeah, but that, Carl, that's the ideal world, and most of us are living in the real world, where the firewall is all you can realistically do. Now, the, the reason that companies like Belden made money is that if you're a firm like BP, um, for example, um, you couldn't do anything other than go out and buy um, thousands and thousands of Belden firewalls Right, because there's no way that you can go to everybody who ever sold you a sensor or an actuator in any of your oil refineries or petrochemical plants worldwide and say, kindly um, sign this contract which uh, uh, requires you to provide um, monthly security updates to everything you ever sold us. You can't do that. Right? They'll say, go away. They'll say, you're no longer our customer. Drop dead. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I have... Um One more before I leave over to Robert. Uh, you implied in medical device safety didn't get the same attention as aviation safety because the economics were wrong. Uh, are wrong. Can you explain this a little more? Okay. Um, so what it means to have 2,000 people dying of incidents involving infusion pumps in Britain every year is this, that people are occasionally given the wrong dose of morphine and they die as a result. A friend of mine who was in a motorcycle accident and with whom I had discussed this issue was in the hospital in Southampton and the nurse was about to give him the wrong dose of morphine and he noticed and screamed and stopped it, right? But if he hadn't done that, he quite possibly have died and nobody would have known, right? Because he was in hospital having broken both his legs and his pelvis. He was in a bad way. So no alarm goes off if such a mistake is made. Now, in terms of scale, our hospital in Cambridge might be killing eight or nine people every year from that, right? And that is not even in the top 40 of the causes of death at that hospital. That's scary. Right? So if you're the hospital's medical director, you paid no attention. What the hospital's medical director should do is insist that all the Um, infusion pumps of the same user interface and that all the nurses are trained on operating that particular pump. But again, this is too low on the list of priorities and so it doesn't get done. How you see to it that this safety usability failure doesn't happen in aviation is that you've got a, a rule which says that you can't land a plane containing passengers unless you've landed that aircraft six times uh, in the previous 90 days, that type of aircraft. So if a, if a pilot um, goes away for a three-month holiday, he's got to do six takeoffs and landings in a simulator before he's allowed to carry passengers anymore. And this requirement for um, familiarity with the type has led aircraft makers to insist that cockpits are similar. Now, this was way back to the 757 and the 767, which Boeing designed so that the cockpits were identical, so a pilot who qualified on one could drive the other. Right? So if you have appropriate training requirements, which are enforced worldwide by regulatory bodies, then the manufacturers will fall in line. But at present, the medical device manufacturers ride roughshod over the regulators uh, because the regulators are all captured. Um, if you look at Britain, for example, our uh, medicines and healthcare regulatory authority tends to have non-executive directors who are retired chief scientists of drug companies. Right? Uh, uh, and this is just how politics works. So there is no way that MHRA can say to the infusion pump makers, you shall all use um, the following um, interface for your pumps. Right. You know, there's, there's no politically feasible pressure point there. Right. Thanks. You had a question? Yeah, uh, a question here. Uh, you're very heavily involved in, in the field of security economics and have been for a number of years. So mm -hmm. for people working out at enterprises and corporations and so on, what would be your advice so we could change the, the, the dilemma that people are facing that you have economics versus security or to, to become security and economics so people got the, the buy-in from the management and from their, their, their peers and others to actually get security in place? 
Well, what you have to do is change the regulatory environment so that, secure, so that adequately secure products are offered. Um, what you cannot have is an environment where people can dump the cost of compliance or the cost of fraud or the cost of accidents on their users. And ultimately, this means government's action. Um, again, if you go and read our standardization and certification document, we discuss there the history of car safety. Now, the first cars appear in the 1880s, if you, if you disregard steam cars, but it wasn't until the 1960s that anybody other than Volvo started taking car safety seriously. Because in America, the incentives were um, just basically to blame the driver for car crashes. And so you've got cars that had lots of fancy chromium ornaments on the front, which would disembowel any pedestrians you hit. Um, you had a, a, a steering wheel which would impale you and kill you if you had even a 30 mile an hour car crash. Um, you, know, there, you had passenger compartments that would crumple and um, squash the inhabitants to death. Um, you know, it, 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 it was absolutely terrible. And this state of affairs persisted for 70 years. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Ross. Uh, I think we don't have any more questions for you today. So thank you very much for participating and, and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> and now uh, we go back to Amel. Thank you very much, Eric. Well, uh, that was mind-blowing and a little bit doom and gloom, but I'm happy to know that people like Ross are working on this issue, try to solve it. I have it from two of my daughters who are working in the health sector. That is, that is the most unfriendly for users environment you can ask for. So I hope for something better. Now, speaking of health, you should get up from your chairs and coaches and stretch your arms and legs while making a nice cup of tea and coffee. I hope you have prepared with some survival accessories like chocolate or candy. And it's time for our first session. And that will mean that you click on session in the hop-in. And that will be with Accenture. DevSecOps in ICS over data diode. We will be back from sessions in 30 minutes. See you later.